Uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, Coburn Conversation for Doors Open Day, uh, for a digital Doors Open Day this year. Uh, welcome to those who've come along. Um, we are very, very fortunate indeed to have Patricia Kepi come along from the Commonwealth War Graves uh, to give us a, a, a chat and a, and a virtual tour around Cumley Bank Cemetery in Edinburgh. So I'm going to, without further ado, pass over to Patricia. Uh, thanks for joining us, Patricia. Thank you very much for the invitation and thanks everyone for coming along this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to set the scene a little to give you a bit of context about how the Commonwealth War Graves Commission works. Of course, there's a great deal more to our history and our worldwide work than I'll be able to show you today, but just to give you a flavour of it. And then we'll move gradually into why we have war graves in the UK and then specifically to Cumley Bank. So, uh, this is our kind of infographic telling you how we work. We look after the war dead of two world wars, 1.7 million people. And we work in, as you can see, very many significant number of countries. Um, 23,000 locations around the world. We're a large employer, especially of horticultural staff, 850 gardeners and 160 craftsmen. And you can see the general sort of in indication of uh, the sorts of things that we have, 50 nationalities amongst our staff working in all these different countries. The largest cemetery that we take care of is Tynecourt in Belgium. And the smallest is a cemetery with four casualties in it, which you'll see photographs of shortly. The youngest person we commemorate is aged 14 and the oldest is probably 68, though possibly 69. That's something that we're always finding out about. So our worldwide commitment, as you can see, most people assume that in the First World War, we were mainly working in France and Belgium but and Gallipoli. But of course, there were all sorts of other conflicts going on. And in the Second World War in particular, our theatres of war were scattered all over the globe. Our responsibility is for commemorating those who died during the two world wars or as a result of the two world wars. So you'll see that the commemoration dates are 1914 to 1921 and then again 1939 to 1947. And you'll see some illustrations of why that is as we go through. This is our hero at the Commission, Sir Fabian Ware, who was our founder. He was too old to enlist in the First World War, so he joined the Red Cross as a volunteer and was working uh, transporting people with injuries from the battlefield on the Western Front. And it very quickly became apparent to him that if the graves of those who fell in battle were not marked very quickly, then they would simply disappear, given the conditions that the battles were being fought in. So he put it to the then government that we should establish what was originally called the Imperial War Graves Commission to record all these deaths and burials. I'm sure many of you have seen this type of photograph before. Unfortunately, people dying in battle, lying where they fell, and the battle moving on quite swiftly, so it was hard to mark the graves. These were the original sorts of grave markers. There are some still in existence of these wooden crosses. There's one in Dean Cemetery in Edinburgh, for example, and they were gradually replaced uh, by the cemeteries taking shape. A graves registration unit after the First World War, when it was safe to do so, in as much as it's ever safe to work in these areas, we still have unexploded ordnance and all sorts of remnants of the war cropping up now. But the Graves Registration Unit marks a map reference of a body where it was found exactly, and it would then be transferred to um, one of our military cemeteries. And this is a records unit, actually. These ladies are from the Second World War working in France, recording all the information coming on from the burial recording parties. And even Hay, General Haig wrote to the War Office supporting the idea of creating the Commission and pointing out that while it doesn't affect the con conclusion of the war, it has an extraordinary moral value as well as to the relatives and friends of the dead at home. And it's important to point out here that repatriation of bodies was not a policy. In fact, it was strictly not allowed for all kinds of reasons, mostly logistical interfering with the conduct of the war anyway, the difficulties of transport, etc. And also there was a morale implication because it's very difficult to tell the population that the war will, over, will soon be over and it's all going very well, while simultaneously bringing back in what would have been thousands of bodies from the bigger battles. So a decision was taken not to repatriate bodies. Our uh, fundamental principles established shortly after the foundation of the commission, which was in 1970, 
are these that everyone should be commemorated individually by name, either on the headstone or grave or a memorial. And the name is what's important. If we have someone's remains, then we would have a headstone. But every person is just as important, even if we don't know where they lie in their final resting place. And that was reinforced by uh, General Bloomer, who opened the Menin Gate in Ypres, which is the biggest memorial to the missing that we have, when he said to everyone assembled there, he is not missing, he is here, because his name is remembered or her name. Headstones and memorials are permanent, which is why we're still working throughout the world today to make sure that they stay in good condition and that every grave continues to be marked. The headstones are uniform in style. Oops, um, let's go back a bit now. And most importantly, let's just see if I can, yeah. Um, oops, sorry, we seem to be missing a bit there. The most important bit about the uniformity is that we don't make any distinction on grounds of rank or creed or race, so that it doesn't matter whether you were Sir, Lef Lieutenant, Colonel, so and so, or Private so and so, your sacrifice was the same, so you get exactly the same type of headstone. So people tend to think that visits to battlefields is a more modern thing. Many of you will have family members who've been on battlefield trips and it's one of the things which greatly stimulates an interest in our work among young people. But in fact, people went to the battlefield to try to find the graves of their loved ones as soon as they possibly could. So this is a mother looking at the grave of, we presume, her son uh, in the 1920s. And Rudyard Kipling, who was involved in creating a lot of the inscriptions that we use as standard policy, referred to our work as the single bit of work since any of the pharaohs, and they only worked in one country. And we work in 150 or more, as you know. So the headstones and memorial panels were, were originally engraved by hand. You can see the gentleman there is engraving a Canadian headstone with the maple leaf. And they could originally create around six of those a day. And they're now nearly all done by machine. This is our workshop in just outside Arras in France. And in, you can see a couple of the paler Portland stones that you're accustomed to seeing in the large battlefields there. And in fact, whether a headstone is being installed in Scotland or in France or in Africa, it tends to go through this workshop. Uh, occasionally we have, we might have a mechanical problem there and we get a, a headstone commissioned locally, but most of them go centrally to the workshop to be trimmed and engraved. Now the headstone, which you'll, I'm sure many of you are already used to seeing, but just so you familiarize yourself with what they look like, no matter where in the world they are, you'll see the traditional curved top there uh, service particulars, so the person's name and the details of the service where we know that. The religious emblem would, is there in the majority of cases, because certainly in the First World War, most people who enlisted in the services would have declared themselves to be of the Christian faith. It was, that was the norm in society at the time. Of course, should anybody have declared a different faith, um, they would have the appropriate symbol like the Star of David for a Jewish casualty or a crescent for a Muslim, etc. If the person said they had no faith, then we wouldn't put a cross at all. And similarly, as I've recently learned, there are some sects of the Christian faith where they might want a Bible inscription, but they don't use the cross as an overt symbol on the headstone. The personal inscriptions at the bottom were something that people were invited to create, a bit like Twitter now, 66 characters. And they range enormously in style and content Many people just put something quite conventional, like a Bible verse or a quotation from literature that would have been familiar to most people at the time. There are some others, however, which are much harder to decipher and much more personal. In Brookwood Military Cemetery, just outside London, there's one that's in code, in the sense that it's in English words, but nobody can quite work out what the significance or the sense is of them. There's one in France, France or is it Belgium, where it's in musical notation and the tune can be played on a variety of instruments, but again, it's not a, some, a tune that people recognise. And sometimes they just say something very simple, like our Jack, and that brings it home to us that that person was an individual to his or her family and friends. And that's quite important to remember, especially when you're in the bigger cemeteries with a sea of headstones around you. Just one point of interest about the shape, you may sometimes see, especially in, in UK cemeteries, 
that you'll see a, a headstone that is exactly the shape but has the corners cut out at the top. And that will mean that it's been placed by the, the Ministry of Defence usually. And that person has died in military service, but out with the period of commemoration that we have. So there's quite a few of those, including a couple in Cumley Bank. So the larger cemeteries, whether in the UK or elsewhere, have uh, a cross of sacrifice if there are more of uh, more than 40 burials there, except Cumley Bank, there's always an exception. And that represents the faith of the many. Uh, and the Stone of Remembrance, designed by Lutians, is there to represent those of other faiths and none. So any cemetery with more than 40 casualties in it will have one or both of those. The garden concept, which we try to adhere to, and it's easier in the UK and Northern Europe, of course, is Gertrude Jekyll's idea of creating something that was as close to an English or British garden as possible so that the person lying there is in their familiar environment and those visiting them would feel at home. Uh, and, and many of you will know Gertrude Jekyll, of course, she designed a very beautiful garden at Sissinghurst in Kent, which is still open to the public. And you can see the sort of planting, and again, you'll see it in later photographs, which is very much the British kind of garden planting. However, in other contexts, these are some Second World War memorials, that's Runnymede Air Force Memorial, top left there and on the top right you can see El Alamein and of course the climate there is so different that you, there's no grass and there's completely different planting. You can see various succulents and so on there to allow for the conditions that the gardeners are operating in. More conventional, this is one of the ones in Arnhem from the Netherlands, much more conventional kind of uh, garden work there. And then just something you may not be familiar with, the book there on the bottom right hand corner is the book of remembrance that we have for the Second World War for civilians. So those will be people killed in enemy conflicts, such as the Blitz, Clyde Bank bombings, etc. And those books are kept in Westminster Abbey. So our largest cemetery, which I mentioned at the beginning, is Tynecourt in Belgium, which has uh, over 20,000 burials and is a very, very impressive and moving place to visit. Uh, still not without its risks. When I was there with our uh, colleagues almost a couple of years ago now, we were shown a site where a reburial was to take place of remains that had been identified. And this was on Sunday. And on Tuesday, uh, an unexploded bomb appeared in this area, so it had to be cleared and dealt with. So there's a great deal of uh, hazards from munition, if you like, throughout. And of course, the many people who are remembered on those panels at the back there are the missing who still lie in and around the battlefields. Our smallest cemetery is this one in North Carolina, uh, which has been recently restored. You may wonder why on earth people should have ended up in North Carolina with Commonwealth war graves. But in fact, these were four British trawlermen who were working with the US Navy to patrol the coasts for U-boats. And this cemetery has to have a lot of work on it quite regularly. You're probably all aware that North Carolina is in a hurricane and flooding area. So it quite regularly gets swamped and has to be put back into the condition that we would like. Okay, so moving on to the points of interest, particularly today, why do we have war graves in the UK? The battlefields in other conflict areas are fairly obvious, but these are the criteria that we use. So you must have been either a serving member of the armed forces, as I said, or when it says recognised auxiliary services, that means things like uh, it might be the additional kind of merchant marine units, etc. It might be the land army, it might be drivers, it might be medical staff, and so on. Or quite often found in the UK, you'd be a form former member of the above services who served and whose cause of death is attributable to that service. And that would include people who came home, who died here of their wounds, of shell shock, of Spanish flu and their cause of death is directly related to their war service. So there will be many, many people who might have survived pneumonia, flu, etc., had they not experienced the conditions in the trenches, for example, being gassed. Uh, so those are often uh, people who have died here. And there are some really sad cases of people who came home suffering terribly with wounds uh, and died here quite some time later. And we mentioned the dates of responsibility earlier. 
So most people who died in the UK who were buried in our cemeteries, including Conway Bank and the others in Edinburgh, were in military hospitals, like Craig Lee's Hospital as it was, uh, then now more familiar to most of you is the Royal Victoria and the, the area of the Western General Hospital. So Craig Lee's Military Hospital treated, in one three month period after the Battle of Luce, it treated 12,000 men. Um, obviously many of them recovered thankfully, but many did not. Training or other accidents, a great many flying related casualties are here because Scotland was used as an air base for training in both world wars. Uh, so a great many of them, because they were training, obviously had accidents and uh, died as a result of those accidents. Air raids, we mentioned the Clyde Bank Blitz, for example, and at home following an injury or illness. Or, uh, and the further north in Scotland you go, the more this is the case, people were killed in action in air battles or at sea. And there, we have many casualties from many different navies and air forces in the Allies who uh, have been washed up on the shores of uh, Scotland and several very interesting stories about those to explore further at another time. So these are our memorials that we actually look after in the UK, mostly naval as you can see for obvious reasons and Brookwood uh, which is a particularly beautiful site if you ever get the chance to visit there. Maintaining the war graves in the UK, especially in Scotland, um, regular inspections. So my colleagues, when they're able to, out with the COVID period, go around the whole of Scotland looking at every one of the 21,000 plus graves that we look after here and making sure that they're in good enough condition, that they're legible. And it doesn't matter whether they're in one of the big cities or whether they're on an island off the far north coast, that, that grave still gets visited, sometimes by contractors, because we only have seven staff in Scotland at the moment. So that's an awful lot of work. Uh, but as you'll see when we get into the tour of Cumley Bank, the gardeners particularly do beautiful work, take a great deal of pride in it. And there are individual solutions at almost every site. I visited the Western Necropolis in Glasgow recently, and it is very, very wet because there was a mine operating very close to it, and the drainage of the whole place is terrible. So that requires specific solutions. So these are some of the gardeners at work, bearing in mind the UK, obviously we have to get it, pack in as much work as we can in the gardens in the summer and spring and autumn months. But our colleagues in other countries, of course, have different challenges. These are two of the chaps who work in Bonin in France, polishing the bronze for the register boxes, which you'll see soon. And the sorts of issues that we have to deal with structural maintenance in the UK, that's, um, it, that, no, actually that's Chetval. And then some colleagues at the bottom there working in India, when it was too hot to work during the day. So we all have challenges wherever we are, flooding as I've just mentioned, and also sadly vandalism, which takes place all over the country, all over the world. And how we deal with vandal episodes of vandalism is that we deal with it immediately. Uh, where possible, we clean any graffiti or anything like that, or re repair a headstone instantly, because the last thing we would want is for a relative of somebody to be visiting their grave and to find it in that condition. So that's always the highest possible priority. So war graves in the UK to have a look at different types of headstone. Um, granite on the left there is most often used in Scotland because it stands up to the weather conditions rather better than the pale Portland stone that you see in the middle. And that's another type of stone on the right. So we use things that are suited to the local conditions and also what was available at the time. And just when you think you know what you're looking for with a Commonwealth Wargrave headstone, you'll find that we also look after a lot of private memorials where the person is commemorated by family who had the means to do so, but um, is not commemorated anywhere else. So we have a responsibility to maintain that headstone and the quality of the name. So you'll see there's one Jewish one for a person there in Hebrew, and then there's this one. So this person was accidentally drowned while on military service. And Mark, moving on to specifically to Edinburgh, this is my colleague Ian, our operations manager, going through Warriston recently, marking where our private memorials are so that the contractor we use can do his strimming properly. And this is in, happens to be in North Merkiston Cemetery, colleagues replacing a headstone because the original one, which you can see there, sunk into a concrete block, had a spelling mistake on it. 
the casualty's name was spelt with an E and it should have been with an A. So Glenn, my colleague there, has dug all that out, dug out the old concrete block and is putting a new headstone into this little beam here, which we call a saddle. And that was probably most of a day's, best part of a day's work. And it was a hot day and he was in full PPE. But all that remains absolutely essential to make sure that we're commemorating somebody properly and correctly. And this is a colleague, one of our volunteers, visiting Rosebank in Edinburgh on the left and Morningside, where you'll see her with the Cross of Sacrifice, looking a bit chilly there, Louise, uh, on the right. And now we get to Cumley Bank. So this is one of the unusual features. I mentioned register boxes before, and you saw the colleagues polishing up the door of a register box. And I do mention this in the film, which we'll get to shortly. But this actually replaced a Cross of Sacrifice, which was there originally and got damaged. And I think the replacement was possibly because of the banking uh, in the ground there, which made it more difficult to maintain a cross of sacrifice properly. Recumbent stones, which again we'll talk about in the tour, and I don't think I've mentioned in the commentary of the tour, the reason for all this shadowing on them is because colleagues are working on different solutions to try and keep the lettering as sharp as possible. So sometimes you'll see that's been shadowed and then another batch will have been polished and we're experimenting until we find the best solution for keeping those letterings clear. Now, three of the casualties we're going to look at specifically on the tour. These are their photographs just to give you an idea. And you'll see um, Brian Hanby Holmes' grave. And you'll see these, the twins here, William and John, who went to Harriet's and Reginald Earnshaw, who is also a casualty we'll be looking at on the tour. So just finishing off with this bit of the presentation. This shows a reburial. We always rebury any remains that are found and identified with as much dignity as possible. And we also are installing new headstones in the UK, including in Cumbly Bank quite recently. We've had a few where the person has been there for over 100 years and the information has been put together to indicate that they should have had a Commonwealth War Grave. And we're now in a position to do that for them. Um, how we funded present contributions from all the partner governments. In this instance, India also refers to ba Pakistan and Bangladesh because India obviously was involved in both the wars before partition. And while that contribution from India is small, it really only represents mostly Muslims because Sikhs and Hindus prefer to be cremated according to their faith. So this is representing the number of burials and memorials that we look after. You can have a look at our website to research anyone who takes your interest or family members. We have an app. So if you're out and about wherever you are in the country or worldwide, you can put in cemeteries nearby, find your nearest war graves. We have a foundation charity, which provides for all our other activities other than strictly the maintenance of graves and memorials. So do have, consider becoming a supporter of that. And just to recap, 300,000 graves and commemorations in the UK, 12,000 sites, you will always be close to war graves. And by far the majority of them have fewer than 10 burials. So we're not looking at the big cemeteries uh, that we see abroad. We're looking at individual communities really. And here's how to contact us. So having whizzed through all that, I will now see if I can stop sharing that bit and then try sharing the film. Fingers crossed, everybody. Yes, there we go. And before I start the film, do please bear in mind that my colleague Robert Ross and I, who'd made this film uh, a week or so ago, are very much amateurs. Steven Spielberg need not be worried about competition here, but we did the best we could. And the cemetery was actually the busiest I have ever known it on the day that we were filming. It would be, wouldn't it? It's good. It's going to be delightful, Patricia. I, <laughs> you don't need to preface this at all. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> so let's go and have, this will take you round Cumley Bank Cemetery. Come to Cumley Bank Cemetery, which is in the city of Edinburgh, quite close to the centre. We're going to look at the war graves here today. And as you can see, most of our cemeteries where there are war graves have one of our green plaques uh, up outside. So you can tell that there are war graves to visit here. And as we move into the cemetery, uh, we have the original old-fashioned gate, but this, uh, the other gate is going to be replaced, having been damaged accidentally, and that's something that the council will look after. 
We're now going to move around to start to look at some of our headstones. You can see just spot one so there. As we move through the cemetery, you'll see individual headstones, some of which are very close to the cemetery wall and to trees, which can make them rather difficult to maintain and access. And this is a typical one showing that the person died in 1920, so well after what we consider the end of the First World War, uh, that he will have died from wounds or illness, and his family have also had uh, a commemoration put on the headstone as well. And then here we see individual headstones, but some difficulty accessing them behind family memorials. That's a Canadian one. You can see the maple leaf as part of the badge there. And under just under surrounding the trees further up here, we have other headstones which are tucked in behind the trees. And we're now coming to the smaller of the two Commonwealth War Grave plots in the cemetery, which is an area that's maintained by us. And it has uh, a collection of graves from both world wars. It's unusual in that at the Commission, we don't distinguish between casualties on the grounds of rank. So we would have um, not have a plot where people were divided by rank. But because this is a council plot, started before we started working in the UK. In fact, in this particular area, there's nobody below the rank of second lieutenant. But you'll see this is very well maintained by my operations colleagues with the planting and the grass mowing that's been done to keep everything looking as lovely as we can. This is a big road that we're using called Fellowship, which is clearly doing very well here. And you see a number of different uh, graves, quite a number of flying related graves here. And there is this one for a 17 year old, which is quite poignant as his brother also served in the First World War and was killed in France. And his mother was already a widow at the start of the war. Uh, so one of the many rather sad stories that we commemorate here. You see, this is what we would call, hello, this is what we would call uh, a private memorial where a family have put in a memorial uh, to their loved one and we maintain it because this is the only place in which we commemorate this casualty. At the end of this uh, small plot in the cemetery, we have an unusual casualty who was from Fiji and who served with the Royal Field Artillery. And you see there are two headstones here. That's because he originally had a private family memorial, which was deemed unsafe and lowered to the ground. And we decided that to commemorate him adequately, we would put in a new headstone in front of it. And it is the Fijian custom uh, for somebody to be buried behind a headstone so that nobody's walking over them when they're looking at the inscriptions. So we believe that is the case. So that brings us to the end of the move through to our larger plot. And you can see here that there's a, a feature which is quite common in a lot of older cemeteries where there's a roundel in the middle, which uh, it used to be the middle because there used to be another entrance to the cemetery uh, directly from the hospital, which is on the far side of here. So we'll walk through the roundel and look at one or two of our headstones as we go. And this is quite an unusual one because it's for a woman serving in the First World War as a driver and she belonged to the Women's Legion, Jessie Coburn. Uh, so again, this is quite an unusual First World War headstone here on the roundel. And you can see as you get to recognise our headstones, 
there were two or three others with their backs to us on the outside of the roundel. And we'll now move on to our main plot here. So this area is the main First World War plot for the cemetery. And it's here because it's next door to what was originally a hospital. Before that, it was a poor house. And it's only recently stopped being a hospital, in fact. So up to 12,000 men were nursed here over a period of months, particularly in the beginning of the First World War. And the council were asked to put aside burial spots for those individuals. So you can see that it's a long stretch of the headstones here. Quite unusual as well in that they're recumbent, as we call them, flat on the ground, which makes them very difficult to maintain. Uh, as we have the challenges of the trees, which are at least three times the height that they were at the beginning of the development of this area. Also, because they're flat, they're exposed to the weather much more than they would be if they were vertical. So this can be a difficult area for my operation colleagues to maintain. And it's also unusual in that we have, normally in this cemetery of this size, we'd have a cross of sacrifice, denoting that we have 40 or more burials on the site. But instead here we have a register box, as we call it. So you can see in the shape of there, there's a door. And in that uh, little cupboard, there is a record of all the people who are buried here who have war graves. And normally there's a visitor's book as well. And behind it, if we'll move around eventually behind there, and see that it's a memorial too. But this is quite unusual in the UK cemeteries to find a register box. And we'll just move down the line of these stones so you can see where they all come from. And we have a group of Canadians at the far end here. Um, very individually, you'll see the maple leaf indicating that. And then across on the other side, again in a single row, we have Australian and New Zealand casualties. as we move down onto the bottom row, we also see a memorial which was put up by somebody when the military died out with our period of commemoration, but this memorial was erected by his comrades. And then on the bottom row, a further group, including several women who were serving in the ATS, Auxiliary Territorial Service. And then just going further back and over towards the other side of the register box you can see that it is also a memorial. And on the right hand side, we can see the person we believe to be the oldest war grave casualty in here, Private Rob. 
who was almost certainly a career soldier and continued to serve when the war broke out. And the last little block in the main plot includes a grave of a Finnish casualty who was, well, technically a civilian serving with the Finnish Legion. We're not quite sure of the story of how he came to be here. Most probably somebody on a ship and came ashore because he was wounded or ill. A great many of the casualties in this plot died from Spanish flu. Uh, might have survived had they not already undergone the experiences that they had in the trenches. And again, here we have a visitor's information panel, which we have in some of the largest cemeteries in Scotland, which gives you a bit of the history of the cemetery and why the casualties are here. And this information can also be found on our website. So we'll move away from the large plot now. And while it may be a little dark, you might be able to see that we also have begin to have lots more individual headstones here. That's a navy one. And here we have a headstone which commemorates two brothers, twin sons in fact, one of whom died in training at Catterick and the other one in action. Uh, so only the one who died at Catterick is actually buried here, the other one is commemorated elsewhere in Gallipoli. And this area also shows the problems that can happen with trees, a lot of uh, fallen branches and so on, which we work very much together with the council to make sure that those don't cause any safety issues. And this is another sad commemoration for a pair of brothers and the two of them are actually buried here. You can see they've got the interlocking badges on the headstone from their different services. Uh, and they happen to have come from uh, a town nearby, North Berwick, and are also commemorated on the East Lothian Roll of Honour. Again, very sad for a family to have lost two sons. Unfortunately, this happened all too frequently. is the newer part of the cemetery where a couple of our headstones are sprinkled in amongst the more modern burials. See there's one there. although it isn't the Commonwealth War Grave as such, is, is a good example of how many war casualties are, are commemorated here by families. As you'll see, if you can see that this one says Corporal Jenkins was killed in action at Arras, and we commemorate him there, in fact, but he's also remembered uh, on this family headstone, which gives you an idea of just how many casualties there were from that period. We have a private memorial here, which is different from the one we just looked at, in that this is the only place that we commemorate this gentleman, Thomas Ferrier, uh, who was killed at Gallipoli, but, it's not, but, not, but unusually, in fact, is buried here, um, because this is his family private memorial, 
and uh, we commemorate him here, which is why the lettering on this is sharper than on the rest of the stone. So yet another pair of brothers commemorated here. The one buried here and the other remembered by the family with an inscription. Similarly, we have a father and son-in-law here, uh, very sad for the women in that family because the father died in First World War, and then the son in law was killed in the Second World War. Yeah, we're now going to move towards the final section that we'll be looking at today, which is where we have quite a few individual or scattered Second World War graves, including the youngest casualty who we commemorate here. The grave of what the person we believe to be the youngest casualty we commemorate at all anywhere for the Second World War, young Reginald Earnshaw. Uh, obviously a very sad story. He joined the Merchant Navy when he was 14 on leaving school. It's not thought that he ran away exactly, he just joined up because he wanted to do, do something exciting as he saw it. And sadly, the ship that he was on was attacked by enemy planes and he was killed in an explosion that resulted from that and landed at Immingham in Yorkshire and because he hadn't given correct details on his enlistment papers nobody knew exactly who he belonged to where he should be and it was believed that he'd enlisted in Edinburgh so he was buried in an unmarked grave here and it wasn't really until his one of his former shipmates came looking for him put together all the information and worked out that this was indeed his grave that we at the Commission were able to commemorate him properly. So this headstone was installed in 2008 and by great fortune his sister was still alive then and was able to come to the ceremony at which we installed it. And family members and the community of Osset in Yorkshire where he was born uh, continue to commemorate him as you can see. But this is obviously a sad reflection on uh, the sorts of casualties that we cover. And the remainder of this area uh, includes the rest of our scattered individual Second World War graves. Okay. Well, that was fantastic. Uh, thank, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, uh, and really, really powerful uh, showing how exactly the huge numbers of casualties. Um, yes. I mean, we have to picture that, that cemetery where, where the trees are much smaller, much less used, and it must become an almost uh, all too regular occurrence that, that there would be another casualty being uh, unfortunately buried there. Yeah, especially with the hospital being right next door. So I'd, I'd had always wondered why the entrance on the current entrance on uh, Crew Road South uh, just didn't seem to be very formal and it's not usual for it to be so far away from the main plot. So further research in our archives and the archives of the hospital indicated that where the gatehouse is. Those of you who know Craigley's Road will know there's a lovely little gatehouse there. Uh, and that, in fact, was also the entrance to the cemetery. Uh, so there will have been, unfortunately, very regular traffic between the two. Um, oh, there's my colleague Elizabeth. Well, but, uh, we've, we've actually got a few uh, questions have come in the Q&A <laughs> as well. So uh, if I perhaps share, uh, and maybe we could come to Elizabeth's um, yes. question. Um, she just popped up there. Yeah. About, about the recumbent slabs, could you tell yes. us why uh, they are uh, the, the Cumley Bank uses those, and perhaps yeah. why there are so many on each slab rather than an individual uh, headstone? Yes, for each one? There, it was originally an architectural decision taken by Robert Lorimer, who was the architect of that area of the of the cemetery and of the plot. But it's also because, as in most parts of the UK, but in Scotland, of course, we call them layers. Uh, layers were set aside for. The, for war casualties as they would have been for families. 
because the people in those graves are not from the same family, a vertical headstone wouldn't provide enough information. So on the vertical headstone, you can put a family name, then the details of individual members and quite a few of them. But to allow for the regimental badge, the service particulars and the names and any inscription to go on that headstone, we had to put the, them on the flat ones. And those casualties in each grave are not related to one another. They haven't necessarily died in the same episode. The layers were just, to put it bluntly, filled up as deaths occurred. Uh, and that's why there might be up to five or six or seven um, casualties in the one grave. It's exactly the same as a family layer, but just marked slightly differently. And, and the, 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 the register of records, um, there's a question about what happens uh, to, to those uh, uh, registers uh, yeah. and the visitor records. Uh, so I, and a supplemental yeah. question too is, uh, do, do those registers include all of the war dead in the cemetery or just the ones in the central area in front all of it? The, all of the war dead in the cemetery. And again, we don't have them in every cemetery in Scotland, unfortunately. It would make it very easy if we did. Uh, but we have them. It's like a book which tells you which section of the cemetery the war dead are in, whether they're in the plot or not. And for the visitor's book, if people are kind enough to write comments in there, every now and again, we take those out of the visitor's book and return them to head office to our archives so that we can assess feedback, address any questions that have come up and so forth. Is, is, is Cumley Bank the, the biggest um, uh, collection of, of, of war dead in, in Scotland? Um, no. So? no, the biggest one is Linus on Hoy. Uh, which is actually a cemetery that we own. We own, only own three cemeteries in Scotland. And one is Linus Naval Cemetery on the island of Hoy in Orkney. And the other two are on Isla for different reasons. Um, Linus was created because of the large numbers of First World War naval casualties originally, then added to with those who died, for example, on the Royal Oak, which was sunk in Scarpa Flow in the Second World War. And the two Isla ones were created because of two disasters which took place at the very end of the First World War, the sinking of HMS uh, Otranto and Toscania, which were ships bringing American troops and others over to Scotland, then to progress to various war fronts. And they sank, were torpedo damaged off the coast of Isla. The islanders worked all night for hours and hours and hours to try to rescue people and bring the bodies ashore. And they were originally all buried in two cemeteries on Isla, but then the Americans, as is their custom, repatriated a lot of the bodies in the 1960s. Some of them went to the American section of the cemetery in Brookwood that I mentioned, and others went home. So there are in fact only three burials left there now. But going back to your question, Linus has over 600 commemorations in it. Um, nearly all navels, and they're, they are interesting because they come from all parts of the UK. So they're not, by, it's quite hard to find a Scot actually when you're looking to research that. There are people from every section of the UK and beyond, and also some German burials there in Linus from the sinking of the scuttling, rather, of the German high seas fleet uh, in Scarpa Flow in 1919. So that is our biggest. And then the Western Acropolis in Glasgow, with the complex around it of Lamb Hill Cemetery, St Kentigern's Jewish Cemetery, and the memorial, that has a vast number as well. But Cumley Bank is, you know, is up there in numbers, certainly. And it's there because, as so many of them are, they were next originally next to a hospital, and very many of the other cemeteries in Edinburgh are the same. Uh, the the graveyards on Isla are ones I know particularly well. My own great grandparents had a croft above Kilhoman and really? were among yeah. were those that were there uh, who were brought in that harvest of the dead, as my grandfather would call them, yes. uh, yeah. for, the, for their burial before they were eventually removed. It's one of the most. Um, it certainly is. As a child going, visiting Kilhoman, it sparked my interest in, yes. in, in, in the war in particular, or going out to the great um, monument at the Mullavo. Yes, oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The one American grave left there, which is the focus, Roy Mancaster is the focus of uh, all the commemorations every 4th of July in particular, and on the anniversary of uh, the sinking, of course, of the Atlanta and Toscania. Is there, uh, as your, as your uh, colleague has asked, is there a, a do you have a favourite uh, Commonwealth War Graves site on in Scotland that, that you? Uh, well, that's very difficult because I haven't visited nearly enough of them uh, to say. I think many of them are very beautiful. I recently visited Dunfermline and Douglas Bank, uh, which is actually nearer to Rosyth than Dunfermline, and that's a really lovely site. It's quite hilly 
and it has some very interesting graves and very individual stories again but they all have their own character I think uh, obviously Cumley Bank is, is very close to me and it's one I know really well so it is a favourite but there are, everyone has its own character there's one in Dirlton in East Lothian uh, which is beautiful because it's very open it has a lot of flying related graves related to the airfields in East Lothian and there are often oyster catchers there there's some lovely planting there so it's very difficult to pick a favourite really um, do you have any advice for, I know you do so much research into the, uh, the individuals who you mm -hmm. commemorate, do you have any advice, obviously the, the first stop should always be the Commonwealth War Graves site because that yes. holds a whole host of information, but do you have any other uh, advice for people who are beginning to start to research, perhaps someone who's uh, um, commemorated in their local graveyard or perhaps an ancestor that they'd like to find out more about? Well, certainly if you, if you have a family name, search on our website and narrow it down. It does depend on how unusual your name is. You could find yourself facing hundreds of people um, with more common names. But it's surprising what you can find out just by Googling somebody's name. Brian Hamby Holmes, who we looked at, whose grave and whose photograph we saw in Cumley Bank, uh, who's apparently Fijian. He's not a native Fijian. He but I just literally Googled his name and got all kinds of information about him and references to other sources, the British newspaper archive, although it can be a bit tricky to navigate, but that's really a great source of information because if you find an obituary for somebody, then you get you find out where their family lived. I would also strongly recommend looking at the website, A Street Near You, uh, which a guy called James Morley has produced because that shows you where somebody lived. So you can go into, for example, for those of you who know Edinburgh, the Stockbridge area, you can just put in Stockbridge in a street near you and it shows you a quite appalling number of casualties just from one street in that area. And you can then go to maybe to a school role of honours, very helpful as well. I found out a lot of information about John and William Lamb from the George Harriet's former pupils website, for example. So there are all sorts of things which are easy and free to look at. And if you get onto the websites which require you to pay for something and then go to the local library when when possible of course because they will often enable you to access something free and then you can work out whether it's worthwhile pursuing a bit more um, but definitely war memorials as well matching up war memorials somebody whose name's on a war memorial to somebody on our website is always really interesting say former pupil website school rolls of honor church rolls of honor and just googling somebody and it's amazing what you will find out that's great advice. Thank you. I mean, and what we've seen are more and more, particularly, uh, it's so important for school children uh, to be yes. able to, when they see a war memorial, to, to to know that there are routes of access for them to find out how the, how these silent names, the yes. lines behind them. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about what sort of work you'll be up to in the coming months? Are there? Any... Uh, well, yes, we've got uh, in, we've got obviously the remembrance period coming up, which is uh, we're going to be dealing with it. Uh, differently this year of course it's not going to be the normal large events that we have but uh, we also are focusing at the moment on our UK sites uh, as a general kind of um, promotion if you like for the Commission's work so very shortly into October we're going to be putting a great deal more information about our UK sites onto our website in a special area and among others we will be featuring in Scotland Cumley Bank is one, Linus is another, Wells Hill, Genefield in Perth, Air Cemetery, Western Acropolis, Oban, King UC, Aberdeen Trinity, and where's the other one? Greenock. Um, so we've got a lot of key sites and others in the north of England, for example, uh, not all that far away. If you live in the borders, you can be traveling down to the north of England sites too, when possible. And for example, where my colleague Elizabeth is based in the north of England, there is a very large CWGC commission site called Stonefall in Harrogate which has a significant number of very interesting Royal Air Force casualties. So we're going to be focusing on those in the next few months and highlighting them. And the individual stories that I've looked at today of uh, Brian Holmes and the Lamb Twins and Reginald Renshaw, there'll be a lot more detail about them and many others on the website coming up in October. And that's the Commonwealth War Graves uh, is that website, CWGC website, yes. That's, fun. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Patricia. This has been a wonderful uh, uh, insight into Cumley Bank today. I really appreciate you coming along to do it. Um, we should Thank probably you. wrap up there because I know that some yep. of our um, uh, participants will be going off now to, uh, there's a live. Yes. 
Yeah, well, there's a, li a live Q&A from um, the National Trust for Scotland over on their Facebook page, at Gladstone's Land, as, as part of Doors yeah. Open Weekend. If you're not well, doing that, interesting. it will. And, but, and if you're not doing that, do have a look at the Coburn Association's uh, uh, website, Coburn Association forward slash Doors Open Days, and have a look at the many venues that are uh, sharing their digital doors open. And then we'll be back uh, broadcasting live again at 4 p.m. with Professor Richard Roger talking about Edinburgh's colony housing. So I hope some of you will join us again. So I'm so sorry that we're not here to give you a round of applause in the room, but that's where we are today. Uh, you really deserve it. It's a wonderful film. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation.